things, ladies and gentlemen, and our non-binary babies, because there are, of course, some. Welcome to yet another episode of Live from the CRJ, the official podcast of the Dilla University Center for Racial Justice. I am Lawrence Weber. I am the project's assistant, and I'm also here with my boss lady. Go ahead. Go ahead. TSX project coordinator. <laughs> okay. She's here with us, and we actually have a very special guest with with us ma'am if you could um introduce yourself introduce myself hello my name is Setua set shakur Setua kai shakur but everyone calls me set it is a well and i for those of you who are rather young <laughs> um Setua is of course a should, should I call you Set? <laughs> yes, yeah, whatever. There we go. Set, Set, of course, is um, a member of the Shakur family that um, is, of course, Miss Afeni Shakur, who was... So I'm the daughter of Matulu and Afeni Shakur, uh-huh. and the sister of many, but um, to speak of Tupac Amaro Shakur. Absolutely, absolutely. And we're actually here to speak a little bit about um, your foundation that you're heading, the Tupac Amara Shakur Foundation. Can you give us a little bit of information about that? Well, um, the Tupac Amara Shakur Foundation started about a few months after his passing, officially a year after his passing. Um, and Initially, it was to be... Um, place for young people to be able to speak their minds and um, their views on society and what was going on around them using the arts um, because the arts is what was able what was the vehicle that my brother used to get to elevate our family out of poverty and it seemed to be especially in the 90s a big place a big tool for our people as a whole that helped um, give us voice and elevate us after my mom's passing in 2016 um, we decided to expand the vision and the mission of the, the Tupac Amaro Shakur Center and it was a center for the arts before we've had uh, four more than 4,000 students come through our doors, and we're really proud of our students. We carried them, or we supported them, and they supported us from the ages of 7 to 18. And today they are part of the fabric of what's running the world right now, so I'm really proud of our alumni. But to, but now, um, after George Floyd, after Trayvon, after Sandra Bland, and all of the names that we we lost, um, and it seems to start happening just before my mom passed. But then, the year my mom passed in 2016, it just got ugly. America, when I say it, America, we, it just got ugly. And um, my mom, I um, don't know if many people on this air knows, but my mother was a part of the Black Panther 21 out of New York City, and um, she defended herself facing 365 years, I believe, on 360 counts. She was pregnant with my brother Tupac at the time. She had 12 co-defendants. Um, she not severed her case, but she de- decided to defend herself, and her doing that helped everyone get off um, she felt like um, no one can fight for her life as much as as, as well as she could. Um, she was like 23 at the time. So she had her whole life to look forward to or her whole life to be given up. And my mother, since and before, she's known as a fierce woman, um, a dynamic woman. And Sandra Bland's passing struck me. After my mother's passing, it, it struck me that um, black women, but black people, black women can be killed and charged just by the way we emote. Um, 
you know, they kept saying she had an attitude or she was rolling her eyes or she was boisterous with the police. And I'm like, well, that's me. Like, that's me. So if I get pulled over, I'm just going to go to jail or I'm going to get killed. And um, with my <clears throat> my parent just passing, you, you get this um, vulnerability of feeling like there's no support for you. There's no absolutely nobody to go to. So we changed the um, mission for the foundation to be around to focus on mental wellness and um, mental wellness in our community, mental and education about our mental wellness and stability, and for us to be able to speak our voice and speak with, speak about what we're going through and what's going on without shame, and teaching professionals how to see us how to see us and understand us in a different man- manner we um did this project with Stanford Stanford Stanford's in California right mm-hmm. yes <laughs> with Stanford University that um researched um all of my med- my personal medical um records and created a uh, a algorithm for therapists to be able to use to be able to understand uh, how to deal with African-American patients better, for African-American patients to be able to communicate with their therapists better. Um, and the fear, the fear of speaking about what we go through and the fear of not being understood, and I've experienced myself not being understood at trying to find help or trying to get support, um, put me into a place where I felt like we had, I wanted to correct that and be there for us when um, things were just so bad that we couldn't, that the words couldn't come out of our, mouth, our mouths politely. Um, so the foundation basically speaks on that. We do things now like um, taking community leaders um, to the spa and go on vacation. Love the spa. Love the spa. <laughs> but, you know, as black women, we've always, it's often heard and spoke of right now, um, but wasn't spoke, spoke of often before this weird time in America, just how much, um, how the lack of tenderness and support and gentleness that we receive or we even give ourselves the the ability to say that we need um so we just want to be support and a supportive hand to all of our people we want to make sure that um others are not allowed to decide what happens to us in times of emergency yeah Uh, absolutely oh i'm sorry go ahead (laughs) i was gonna say like i mental health is definitely um we're trying to bring more and more awareness to it. We actually hosted a mental health boot camp for kids last summer, oh. and we're going to be doing another one this summer with um, former Saints player Delvin Bro. We want to support he, that however we can. Oh, that'd just be, let me know. Yeah, yes. definitely. Cause, and it's like seeing how a lot of kids still don't aren't aware of mental health or they don't understand the difference between being sad and being angry or, you know, like understanding. Mental the, wellness. Yeah. Mental wellness and awareness. Yes. Right. And it's like. It's a it's a stigma in the black family to say you need help, to say something's wrong or the trauma that we haven't even, you know, um, healed from, from slavery, Jim Crow. Like we we just kept going and going and going and no one ever stopped and said, hey, yes. we, we need to actually tap into that trauma and tap into where we are now versus then to keep moving forward. Because we just kept going and going. And you know, what you said earlier, um, not not even not knowing the difference between being mad and sad is one thing for us to not know the difference, which is something, first thing we need to um, be aware of and be able to teach and be able to speak of. Mm-hmm. But then when others are don't know the difference between when we're mad and sad and right. I, um, I can just be crying in the street and someone say she was aggressive. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. And I, it, I definitely had a friend who was depressed, and it was – complicated you know like I didn't know what was wrong I was like is she mad at me is she you know is what could I do I felt like I didn't know what to do and it would have been nice to know like okay she's actually depressed like instead of me taking it more personally Personal. yeah and right. I did because then we isolate from each other and mm-hmm. then 
I mean, our community, the last thing we need is to be more separate. Right. You know? right. And um, at, what, what, what you were saying earlier just kind of reminded me of right at 2020, right in the middle of everything that was going on. I spoke to my um, my therapist, who was an older white man, um, and I literally had to kind of walk him through yes. what I was feeling, yes. and a piece of me. And he, at the at the very end, he was like, "Thank you," because I had no idea how that how that was. You know but then how you, you had were to feeling. Pay for to help someone help you. Thank you. Yeah. So, like I said, it's and it's it's not for lack of care. It's just, I mean that that's not on the back of their mind on a regular basis. Um, but it's on the back of our mind, right? Absolutely. As as, as this is so this is so sick that. Um, how, how do we identify with one another? That's black Americans, as African Americans, as mm-hmm. colored people. Like that's the whole, all of whatever it is that we have to be. However, we are identified. We're still the most. And, and we have the most empathy out of all of uh, everyone in America. We empathize with the white woman and in the neighborhood who you can tell her man is beating her. They don't have, we don't have to guess. They don't have to stop us and tell us we, we know this. We lend our hand. We help the lady on the bus with multiple children. We'll get up and give them a seat. But that comes easy for us. And for others, it's as if it's, I don't think it's what I'm trying to say is I don't think that it's a pass that it's not on the front of their minds. Mm-hmm. It should, as a human being, it should be on the front of your mind. I think one Absolutely. of the things, the main things that we, I want to teach is, the, or I want the foundation to be a voice for, is just that we shouldn't have to sing and dance in order to be seen as beings with emotions. We shouldn't have to. And then, because, you know, that's how rap started, right? Rap started with, from my understanding, I'm, I'm born in New York, but the way that I experienced the beginning of rap is the men in my community, the black men in my community, my cousins, my brothers, my uncles, the man down the street, the guy down the street, the kid in my class, needing to have a voice and for that voice to not be suffocated by drugs. And they was like really trying to do better, trying to, okay, I'm not going to do this, but you still have to hear me, right? Mm-hmm. So... Hip hop gave us a voice, but then that, as they're they're speaking our pain for us, they're being targeted and challenged because they're speaking negatively, right? And so right. our feelings shouldn't just be have to be a black and white thing. Either I'm Sammy Davis Jr. or I'm Tupac, and you're scared. Like absolutely, you're and like I said, at the very beginning of it, because I I, I wasn't around for the very beginning of it, obviously. Um, but it just seemed like the narratives in many of the songs, well, aside from Rapper's Delight, because Rapper's Delight is rather fun. Um, but the message that came right after yeah, that or right around the same time is like, like, things like very don't, clear. Yeah, Don't, don't like, push me because I'm close the to the edge. We heard. <laughs> it's like this, one of the first things we heard in hip hop is that. Yeah. Right? And I'm trying not to lose my head. Exactly. He's literally trying. And they were wearing, like, really, like, shiny clothes at the time. Like, they was, like, wearing half shirts and <laughs> feathers. Like, yeah. you know, they were really not trying to be um, scary looking. And even, like, moving on to that, a lot of times the mis- the misconception, and it has been the misconception since I was a child, um, is that you're glorifying this violence you're glorifying this even if we go to my time growing up in the 90s and and like the e of of gangster rap and all of that they're saying that okay you're glorifying it's like no it's happening (laughs) i think it's both i think there's times that um it needed to be said Mm -hmm. for others to hear it um 
And then there's times that the glorification comes when we're not holding ourselves accountable uh-huh. for the actions. Like, personally, I don't feel, I don't understand why we're, how there's still black people that shooting black people. I don't understand it at all. At all. And no realm possibility. I mean, even if you hurt my child at this point in the development of who we are as a race and what we've come, especially based on what we've come to come through, I feel like I should be able to go to our community and have this man charged within our community, whoever abused my child or whoever stepped, you know, over, stepped over a line. And we can handle it ourselves in a different way besides murdering each other. Um, so the glorification comes when we continuously look over, gloss over what, what's happening in our community as if it's okay um, and use the image of that to sell an album, the image of mm-hmm. this child dying, you know, or this mother. You're talking about somebody's child when, when Absolutely. you're singing, when you're putting, you can put a beat to it, but you're still talking about somebody's absolutely, child. Absolutely, absolutely. What is the biggest mix, it, it, the biggest misconception about, about mental health and wellness, especially within the black community, because it's for, I, in my opinion, it's a relatively new topic. It's just now, yes. within the last six or seven years, that we've actively started talking about it without the, oh. The stigma. Oh, yeah, it says. So I've been dealing with my mental health um past 20 years. Um, when I'm not, when, when I say dealing with it I mean like the first 10 years first five years was like I didn't go to college I stepped away from everything else I moved to a community that was that would support this life I had two children really young I was in my 20s my brother my two brothers had just died and I just dove into group therapy individual therapy Meditation, walking meditations, learning how to handle what I thought was the end of the world. I mean, my brother's passing spiraled me into like deep, deep, deep depression. And what I, before that, um, I had a lot of rage from my childhood, rage. Um, I was at, they called it the rage attacks. Um, what I realized is acting crazy. You go to jail. If you are crazy, and I'm using the word crazy loosely, mm-hmm. if you are crazy, you can actually get help. So if there's a truly a problem, and we really, if you're sad inside or you're broken inside or you're mad inside, like you, we, there should be a place for us to talk. You can talk to us. You can talk. There's a community that's here waiting for you, and we can find you help. Acting crazy is a glorifying of the pain and it's and it's not being uh, holding yourself accountable for either being upset at your dad being upset at your your, your upbringing being upset at your surroundings mm-hmm. say i'm upset but not but don't for i am needing for my people i'm needing for us to stop to feel the same way as i do it's not i can't i'm i'm done with having to apologize for our actions i'm done with being upset at other people for being afraid of us because of we have to do that, right? We're upset that they're putting harder time and harder sentencing on our young people. And I hear a lot of people talking about that lately. But I don't hear a lot of people talking about how many guns live in your house? How many children that you know are walking out of your house with a gun? How many kids that you know are upset about something that you're not addressing? Like, let's be more upset about how we're failing us right now before we once again allow these other people to measure us and to um, sentence us in whichever way that they do, whether it's by, with a gun, whether it's throwing us in a mental, even in a mental institution and saying, oh, she's crazy, but you're not they're not looking at and addressing 
how to help this person. Absolutely. I feel like we should be able at this point in life to do what we need to do for ourselves. Absolutely. Um, and, and I, yeah, we're, we're running a little thin on time, but I did have one last question to kind of bring us out. I asked this of almost every guest that I've done this. If you had, if, if the foundation had a magic wand to either give or eradicate something, what would that, what would it be? Fear. Fear is the only thing that um, it's the opposite of love. Love and fear cannot live in the same house. And um, yeah, fear. Absolutely. Ms. Shakur, thank you so very much. First of all, I am excited that a lonely little goofball like me actually actually got a chance to interview you i'll tell that say that because i'm 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 a little oddball so <laughs> honestly this is big for me i yeah i'm a 97 baby so i was way <laughs> after the fact but his your brother's impact is huge like i've always heard about tupac i've always heard like his songs the movie that recently came out and even like after learning about him going to art school and stuff, it's like you think some of these rappers just come out, but he really made it a craft and built on it. And that's you, you just don't see that anymore. Or kids going, they don't think they need it. Mm-hmm. So just knowing like he made a blueprint for a lot of people, and the impact is is nothing but amazing. And I know you're so um, using his name, and um, I mean for the foundation. Is gonna go big, like and, so and like I said, I I grew I I grew I I was born in eighty four, so <laughs> I literally like grew up listening to it. Still do, um, but thank you so very much. Where well. can they find? Where can they find your website? T um four the number four t a s f dot org. Okay, our website, and I believe it's the Instagram as well. Yeah, it's the Instagram as well. So make sure you head over to 4TASF.org and follow them at 4TASF on Instagram. But until next time, I am Lawrence Weber. I'm the project assistant. And you can find us on Instagram at CRJ underscore DU, on Facebook at CRJXDU, and you can email us at crj at dillard.edu. That is crj at dillard.edu. Until next time, I am Lawrence Weber, the project assistant, along with TSX project coordinator. Thank you so much for listening, and we appreciate you. We'll see you next time. Bye.